Hope everybody's doing good this morning. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, open with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, but as you do that, Isaiah chapter 9, I want to take a minute and just tell everyone just how loved I feel as your pastor this morning. If you were here last week, evidently there was some sort of issue challenge uh, laid, uh, a challenge issued to bring me Christmas tree cakes. And as you can tell, I have no shortage of Christmas tree cakes now. Um, I was I was not here. Dustin was uh, preaching for us, and uh, he evidently he talked about my addiction to Christmas tree cakes, which is true. However, I am not that addicted to Christmas tree cakes. And what you what you see right there is literally only the beginning. There are just as many boxes as there are right there that behind that. Um, just overwhelmed. Uh, to the point where I'm going to have to find somebody who wants some Christmas tree cakes. So if you want some, we'll talk afterward, okay? You can, you can, you feel free to come and take a box, okay? Um, now, with that said, not only did I get Christmas tree cakes, I got what I consider to be the greatest Christmas movie of all time today, Die Hard. Somebody brought me a copy of Die Hard, and in my experience, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who think that Die Hard is a Christmas movie and those that are wrong, Okay. So, uh, Die Hard has my favorite movie line of all time, now I have a machine gun, ho, 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 okay? Um, <laughs> can't tell you guys how loved I feel to be uh, your pastor this morning. Uh, thank you for, for the fun, that was awesome. Literally, so many people, this is not an exaggeration, so many people brought me Christmas tree cakes from the first service. I set down my Bible to hold them and lost it. I'm like to the point where I got up here to preach last service with my iPhone in my hand, reading my notes, and literally had a, to, to tell a couple people in the back, like, if you could find my Bible really quick, that would be great, okay? And they did, so we're good. So all, the crisis averted. Um, it, it has been a, a truly crazy morning this morning, and I'm glad that we get to continue on in our series on the name. Uh, before we start, though, I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and then we'll dive into the, the Scripture, okay? Let's pray. God. I thank you so much for who you are, dear God, and how you love us. God, uh, truly, dear God, as I just examine my own life, I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed at your mercy and your grace, Father. Lord, I pray this morning that you would just silence our, our restless hearts and draw us close to you, and you would focus us now so that we could leave here and know you better. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you got your Bible, Isaiah chapter 9 a famous Christmas passage here today. Uh, one thing that as, as I was preaching downtown last week, I pointed out to downtown that I want to be sure to point out to you today uh, is the kind of the reasoning behind the series as we've kind of progressed in our series on the name. If you've been here over the past few weeks, you've noticed that we have been uh, going over the names of God revealed to us in Scripture. And what I hope you notice is that, is that we have started uh, with the most general names of God revealed to us in Scripture. So even really we started with the name Yahweh which is the most uh, most often used name of God in all of scripture then we moved to Adonai and Elohim uh, and we talked about the names of God revealed to us in the Old Testament um, that were just general names now as we turn toward Christmas one thing that I want to make really sure you know that we're intent this started last week but that we've been intentional to do is that we are moving from looking at the general names of God revealed in scripture to look looking at the specific names given to Christ as we approach Christmas. Here's why that's really important. There's what we call in Scripture a progressive revelation. That means that, think of it like you're, you're climbing up a mountaintop. And you're not going to get to, the, when you get to that peak of the mountaintop, then you can see everything and understand everything more clearly. In Scripture, what happens is we start with a, uh, a revelation of God, but it's a progressive revelation such that when we are climbing up the mountain, okay, when we are going up the mountain, we begin to get understand God clearly and more clearly and more clearly, and we don't reach the mountaintop until we get to Jesus Christ. And when we get to Jesus Christ, we understand everything more clearly. So that's why we have started out with just general names of God, and now as Christmas approaches, we're looking at the more specific uh, intentional names given to Jesus. And I want to just encourage you, be here next week, because this is going, we're going to reach the peak of this mountain next week as we look at the, na uh, at the names of Jesus, okay? Uh, but today, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to be looking at a specific um, name given to Jesus. 
And I want to just encourage you, this is going to be a little bit more practical in our approach to the name uh, than our last few have been. So if it's a little bit different, that's what you're, that's what you're sensing. So Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 6, a famous uh, Christmas passage that we read every year. You ought to know it. Isaiah 9, 6 is what the Bible says. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, listen, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Specifically today, I want us to focus on the, the name that I feel like sums up this whole passage, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace is the sum of all the names given to Jesus uh, as, as in this prophecy here. And I want us to spend some, day, some time today thinking about what it means that Jesus is introduced to us before he is ever born on this earth as our Prince of Peace. Now, this name, Prince of Peace, is given to Jesus as promised to Israel during the midst of a time of spiritual gloom. As a matter of fact, when you go back, go back and read Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 8, and what you'll see is that as this prophecy is being built up, as God is getting ready to give this prophecy, what you'll notice is that Israel is in a time of literally spiritual depression. So much so that God tells his, his prophet Isaiah, you are going to need to separate yourself a little bit from these people in the way that they're talking because you're my guy. It's a time of spiritual gloom. But then, even though everything seems to be falling apart in Israel, when you turn the page to Isaiah chapter 9, even though the kingdom of Israel is literally falling apart at the seams, God comes to the people of Israel and he promises them something. And what he promises them in the midst of spiritual depression is this, a prince of peace. And that's really important for us to understand because just how Jesus comes to the people of Israel as a prince of peace in the midst of spiritual depression is how he's going to come to us. So with that said, I think it's really important that we talk about why it is that Jesus is our prince of peace and what it means today. Now, I, 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 as I told the first service this, and I really believe it's true, this is more important for our spiritual health to understand than maybe any other name uh, any other name of Jesus that was prophesied. And I want to tell you why. That Jesus is our Prince of Peace addresses our most fundamental desire in all of life. You see, you may not realize this about yourself, but the truth is, every single one of us, our greatest desire in all of life is peace. And here's what that means. Your greatest desire in all of life is to be able to lay your head down on your pillow at night and drift off to sleep with a peaceful heart. That is your greatest desire in life. Now, some of us go about that in different ways. Some of us go about trying to achieve peace by having more money, having more, more success, having true love, having good kids, all of these things. We may, we may try to chase peace in a different way, but all of us at the end of the day are after one thing, to be able to lay our head down at night and sleep with a peaceful heart. So that Jesus is our Prince of Peace means that he's coming to meet our greatest need, peace in our heart. So today what I want to do is I want to focus exclusively on Jesus as Prince of Peace. I want to ask two questions for us. I want to answer two questions that come from this reality that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. The first question is this. Number one, why do we need peace? So if Jesus... Listen, if Jesus is our Prince of Peace, the question that we have to answer first and foremost is if Jesus is bringing us peace, why do we even need peace? What is Jesus, why is it that Jesus has to come to us as a Prince of Peace? So if you've got your Bibles, here's what I want you to do. I want you to flip a couple places with me. Uh, the first place I want you to flip is Genesis chapter 3. Why do we need peace? First answer that, the answer to that question is twofold. The first reason we need peace is this. We need peace because of the burden of sin in our lives. The burden of sin in our lives. Now, every single one of us, if you go back and read, you read Genesis chapters 1 through 3, what you'll notice is that every single person in the world was created for a purpose. And that purpose was this, to walk and live life in the presence of God. But something happens in Genesis chapter 3 that breaks that purpose up. 
In Genesis chapter 3, you go and you read, this is what, if you turn your Bibles, it's not going to be on the screen. In Genesis chapter 3, you go and read that Adam and Eve were literally living life in the presence of God. And the Bible says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some also to her husband. Here's what's going on here, and we're going to walk through this a little bit more in just a second. Adam and Eve, and simultaneously every person who's ever been born, was created for this. They were in the garden walking with God day in and day out. They were living in His presence. But in one instance... They decided that rather than walk in God's presence, rather than follow God, rather than be obedient to God, they would rather have things their own way. And in that one moment, something called sin entered the world and shattered everything. And the main thing that happens here is that it breaks the, ser- it breaks the fellowship that was between Adam and Eve and God. I want to show you this in Scripture because it's going to come back up in just a little bit. Look at verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths, and they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now notice what what the Bible just said there. God literally, in the garden, came down during the cool part of the day and walked with them. Can can wrap your head around how awesome that is. God had it. They had a time scheduled to walk with God in the cool of the day. Verse Verse, uh, continuing in verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden cool day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. You notice what happened there? Man and woman were created to walk in God's presence, to live in God's presence, and when sin entered the world, the burden of sin made them run from God's presence. We have no peace in life, listen, we have no peace at life. We stay awake at night. The main reason we don't have peace, the main reason we stay awake at night is because we were created to walk in the presence of God, but we live under the burden of sin. Every single one of us are under the burden of sin after, the, after what happened in the garden happened. And so we laid our head down on our pillow at night, and even the best among us, even the most well-behaved among of us know this, that before God, we are sinners. Anybody like um, anybody an Eric Church fan in here? We got a we got a couple. All right, good. I told the first service this is like my own personal vendetta here for a second. I love Eric Church because Eric Church um, is the epitome of what country music should be. Okay, he's uh, he's not like break dancing on his head, right? And he's not rapping, and he's not wearing uh, clothes that were meant for women. All right, like that's my guy. All right, his blue jeans were meant for men. All right. I, I, I love Eric Church. He, me, and, me and Jenna listen to him all the time. I was, I was riding down the road this week, and Eric Church uh, has a new album. It's a fairly new album called uh, Desperate Man. And there's this one song on this album called Monsters, okay? And, man, I've been listening to this song, and there's a part in this song where he, he, he sings a lyric, and I could understand the last half of it, but I, he goes too fast for me. I couldn't understand the first half of it. Like, a lot of you, that's how you feel about me, right? Now, go too fast, you can't understand half the things I say. That's, well, that's what happened with Eric Church. And so I was listening to this song, and uh, the lyric, I Googled the lyrics because I wanted to understand what he said. And this is what the so- is the song called Monster says. And he's talking about how when he stays up late at night, uh, he, and checking for monsters under, underneath his, his son's bed, right? Uh, but he says, as an adult, the monsters that haunt us are a little bit different. This is what he says. The wolf hunts a hungry man and the devil a lonely heart. A minefield of bad decisions lay hiding in the dark. And this is where I think it gets really good. Greed steals, sick, greed stalks, sickness steals, and pride lays a wicked trap. You can't avoid them all. you got to trust me on that. What's he say? It, go and listen to the song. It's a really, it's a, it's, the song will honestly preach. It's a sermon in and of itself, all right? But what's he saying? He's saying the monsters that haunt adults are no longer the ones that lay up under their bed at night, right? 
we all got kids. If you got kids in here, you, you go in there at night and tuck them in, and they, they might get a little scared because they might think a monster's in the bed or a monster's in the closet. He's saying that it's different when you get to be an adult. Because when you get to be an adult, the things that haunt you at night, the things that rob you of your peace are not the things that you're worried about being up under your bed. They're the things that live in you. They're the sin that lives in your, lives in your heart. It's the greed and it's the pride and it's the selfishness and it's the lustfulness that keeps you up at night. So I want you to understand this. The main reason that we don't have peace in our hearts and in our lives is because we were created to live in the presence of God, but the monsters of sin are weighing us down. So we need peace because of the burden of sin. The second reason we need peace, though, and I think this, depending on where you are in your life today, this may speak to you a little bit differently, okay? The second reason we need peace in our life is because of the chaos of life. Anybody in here, man, like, you ever just feel like the hamster on the wheel, right? Like, you're just running, and, like, it doesn't matter how hard you run, you don't catch up. Life is just crazy. Anybody? Okay, everything's good. Awesome. Yeah, we've got a couple people who are honest. Read, turn with me to Romans 8. I want you to see something this morning. Romans 8, starting in verse 18, I want to show you something from Scripture to kind of prove my point here. So, we all know we need peace. There's no peace between us and God because of the burden of sin that lays on us. The other reason we need peace between us and God is because of the chaos that exists in the world around us. Look, if you got your Bible, Romans 8, starting in verse 18, this is what the Bible says. For I consider, this is Paul writing, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Verse 19, for creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. What's Paul saying there? I want you to, I want you to see what's going on in this text here. Paul is literally saying that when sin entered the world, we know that it messed up the relationship between us and God, right? Every one of us knows that when we do something wrong and we have that voice in our head that haunts us at night, we know that's because sin has messed up our relationship with God. A lot of times what we fail to realize is that when sin entered the world, it went off like a nuclear bomb and the fallout didn't stop with us, but the fallout tore the world apart such that the world around us is now broken because of the fallout of sin. And he's saying creation is groaning because it's broken. Let me, if you've been alive longer than five minutes, and you've been contri uh, contributing to society longer than five minutes, you should be able to look around and notice that, man, something is wrong with the world. Think about how... You may have a good life in here today, and that's, that's awesome, but just think about how broken even your good life is. We're getting toward the, close, the end of 2019. How many of you this past year, you lost somebody? How many of you this past year, you got diagnosed with something you didn't see coming? How many of you this past year turned on the news every single day and saw a different tragedy happening somewhere else that shouldn't be happening, right? And in our hearts, what we know is that, man, something is broken in here. There is chaos going on in this, in this world that, that is not right. The world's broken. But even take a step back from that, and the chaos that's going around in the world is going on in our life. Because if we can just be honest, that if there's one thing we know for sure, it's that life is just hard. Anybody, anybody agree with me? Life is, is, is hard. Because sin has broken the world we live in, we live a life that is hard. And let me just, I just want to encourage you this morning. Marriage is hard. My wife's right here. Like she, I think she was the amen. All right, being married to me is not easy. Marriage is hard. Parenting is hard. Your, a career is hard. Family, friends, everything in between, everything that makes up our life is hard. And if there's one thing we're all being honest about, it, there's not only chaos going on in the world around us, there's chaos going on in us because everything around us seems like it should be a little bit easier. But when we wake up, when we plan calendars and we put kids to bed and we cook meals, one thing we know in our heart, man, is life is hard. I want to prove, prove my point to you. 
how many of you lived your life, and maybe even this past week, you've looked to your spouse, you've looked to somebody and you said, things will be easier then. Anybody? Things will be easier, parents, things will be easier when they get this age. Career, life will be easier when this person is gone. Things will be better when. Can I ask you can I ask you this? Have you ever got to win and it actually been easier? No. Why? Because there is chaos everywhere. And it starts in our own life. I mean, I'm I told the first service, I'm not I'm not above this. This past week, Jenna has if, if you need anything to go through our schedule, let me just tell you, Jenna's the person to go to, all right? If you come to me and say, I want to do this, I'll tell you, yes, that's awesome, that's great. My wife's the actual one who has the calendar, so you need to talk to her. But Jenna's got this calendar, and we live and we die by these calendars, all right? I have been blessed God out more <laughs> about the calendars in my home than anything else, right? Because if we have something, it's got to be on the calendar. Anyway, that was beside the point. She's going to get on to me later for that. When we go up to this calendar this past week, and several people have just been asking us, like, we'd love to get together over the holidays. We'd love to do this. We'd love to do this. And, man, that's great. Don't, don't hear me say that we don't want to do that. We love that, all right? We, we want to do that with everybody. But me and Jenna, had, we had one couple come to us and ask, we'd love to get together and eat dinner. And so we said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the calendar. So me and Jenna go to the calendar this past week, and we're looking at it on the refrigerator. And it looks color organized and all that because Jenna's crazy. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. And literally, guys, in December, there was one day. And I, Jenna said, we can do this day right here if, if, if we want to do it. And so I text the person and say, hey, man, we got, we got this day. And like, I felt kind of like a jerk because I didn't offer many other alternatives either, right? But as me and Jenna were sitting there talking, I looked at her, and I was like, well, it's December. You know what? It will be easier when. And I caught myself, and I realized that in that moment, I had lied to her, and I had lied to myself. Because a lot of times when we lay our head down at night and we go to sleep, man, and we're drifting off, everything can be right between us and God. And this world around us is just hard. It's chaos. So we need peace, guys. We need to be able to lay our head down at night and have peace. And here's what I want you to understand. You will not find any peace in this world. I, I hope that's encouraging to you this morning. Life is hard and you are a sinner. And if you are looking for peace to be able to lay your head down on the pillow at night, I want you to know you're not going to find it. Not in anything this world has to offer. That's why Jesus comes to us in Isaiah chapter 9, and the fulfillment of his names is Prince of Peace. Look with me at the second question and answer. So we all know, so we establish the fact we need peace, right? We can all agree on that. The question then is if we need peace and nothing in this world is going to offer us peace, nothing's ever going to get any better, right? We're still sinners and life's always going to be hard. Dallas, where is the one place we can find peace? And here's the good news that we can find peace in Jesus. First, we find peace in the sacrifice of Jesus. If you got your Bible, flip over with me to Colossians chapter 2. Starting in verse 13. This is probably one of the most important texts, one of my favorite texts in the New Testament about how the sacrifice of Jesus actually works. And I'm going to explain something to you as you're going there. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Let me explain to you what Paul's about to, to be addressing. And the Roman Empire, the way it worked is when someone was imprisoned or executed, the charges that were leveled against them would have been nailed either to the cross above their head when they were executed or above their, um, above their jail cell so that when you walked by their execution station or their jail cell, you could easily identify this person is in jail, this person is being punished for this reason, right? If anybody remembers the, um, the passion narrative uh, of Jesus, right, when Jesus is being executed, he has what put above his head? King of the Jews, right? Now, the only thing different about what is put above Jesus' head is that Jesus, or that uh, Pilate had a guilty conscience concerning Jesus, so he didn't so much list a charge against Jesus as just a statement of fact of what Jesus was, was being crucified for, right? So in the, in, in, in the Roman Empire, when you were imprisoned for something, when you were executed for something, you would have had your charges labeled above your head. So let's to put it as practically as I could put it before you this morning, if I were in prison for my sins, my, my crimes against God, my charges above my head would list, here is in prison Dallas Wilson, a prideful, selfish, lustful human being who rebelled against God, right? Now that's just me. Yours would say, 
insert your sins there, a rebellious person against God, right? That, that is what would be above your head. But look at what Colossians chapter 2 says in verse 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses, look, by canceling the record of debt. That record of debt there is referring to the charges that would have been nailed above your head. What Paul is saying is that every crime, everything, every sin that is listed above you, that imprisons you, that robs you of peace in your life, everything that when you lay down your head at night, you think about the minefield of bad decisions that lay in your past, right? Everything that haunts you at night, every sin is nailed to the cross and erased by the blood of Jesus Christ. So that everything that keeps peace between, keeps there be, from being peace between you and God is gone. 100% erased. Here's what that means. We were created to live in God's presence. But in Genesis chapter 3, we ran from God's presence because of sin. Because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, we no longer run from God's presence. We run to God's presence. Because everything that separated us from him, everything that keeps us up at night, has been erased. I want you to know this, and man, this, is, this may be the most important part of the sermon right here. And I, I, I feel like this is where God really moved in the first service. Our most fundamental need in life is peace with God. Our most fundamental need in life is peace with God. Understand what I'm going to tell you. You can have everything on the horizontal together. Let's say you are good enough. You're not good enough, but let's say you are good enough to make the horizontal and everything in life go as planned. Let's say you're good enough to eliminate the chaos that exists. Maybe, man, maybe your spouse doesn't work and, like, your kids are perfect so that, when, man, you come home at night, like, there's supper on the table, your ki- you sit down and do family devotions, and, man, your kids say, teach us the word of God, Father, right? You lay, you, you lay down, e- everything is perfect. Like, everything in your life is a well-oiled machine. There is never a moment where you and your spouse argue. Your career is great. The chaos, chaos of life does not apply to you. Let's say you're good enough to make that happen. You're not, but let's say you could. Here's what I want you to know. If everything in life and the chaos of life was removed, but you did not have peace between you and God, you still wouldn't be able to lay your head down in peace at night. Because the most fundamental need for peace that you have have in life is not peace on your calendar. It's peace before the creator of the universe. You've got to get the vertical right before the horizontal gets right. And here's, here's the encouraging part before we move on to how we find peace in the chaos of life. If you get the vertical right, the horizontal will fall into line. Can I just tell you, my marriage is never better than when I'm right with Jesus. My job is never easier than when I'm following Jesus got to get the horizontal right you got to get the vertical right before you get the horizontal right so that brings us to the question the second question where do we find peace in the midst of chaos in the chaos of life and here's where we find it we find peace in the presence of Jesus so man once we have peace between us and God once we can lay our head down the pillow at night and, and know that man we're good in God's sight the reality is and a lot of, I know this is true for a lot of us, that everything in the world can be right between us and God. We could be walking in fellowship with God, and we can lay our head down at night, and we can still be worried about everything else that's going on in life. Parents, how many times have you laid your head on the pillow at night and been worried about your kids? How many times have you laid your head on the pillow at night and been worried about something that may or may not happen at work? Right? Everything can be all right between us and God. And we still have to be involved in the chaos of life. And here's what I want you to know. That we find peace in the midst of chaos in the presence of Jesus. So many of us look in the, in, for pr- peace in our circumstances. If we can, What we think is if we can ever get everything just right in life, right? If I can ever manage to get my home life and my work life and my marriage and my kids, and I can manage to get all those things lined up, then I'm going to have peace. Here's what I want you to know. 
Straight encouragement right here. Until the day you die, your life is going to be hard. You are never going to be able to get all those things lined up so perfectly that you can find peace. And if you ever manage to get them that way for a second, be very afraid because chaos is coming. The presence of Jesus is the only thing that will get us through the chaos of this broken world. So much so, listen, that if you have Jesus, the world around you could be burning down but you can still have joy. Mama, your kids can be acting crazy. They can be absolutely losing my, their mind, right? But if you are living in the presence of Jesus, you can go through the chaos of this world with joy. You could be have your job, guys, women. You could have your job literally falling apart around you. So much so that you don't know that there's security from one day to the next. If you are living in the peace of Jesus, if you are living in the presence of Jesus, you can have joy despite the chaos. Now notice how I'm wording that. I'm saying there's joy despite chaos, not because there is no chaos. But what does Jesus tell his followers when they go when he when he's at the last supper table and he, he's about to be crucified, everything in the world's about to fall apart for them and what's the one thing he tells them? Let not your heart be troubled. In other words, it does not matter what's about to happen. It does, not ima- it does not matter how crazy your life gets. It does not matter how full your calendar gets. It does not matter how bad everything seems to be going. As long as I'm with you, you're going to be okay. Let not your heart be troubled. And I really want to just close it out thinking about it this way. Like, Listen, if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't have peace with God, that's the first step. But if you're here and you're a believer, I want to challenge you that the place you've got to start looking for rest is in Jesus Christ alone. So many of us live our life, listen, and I'm just as guilty of this as anybody, looking for rest. And can I just say, that's a good thing. Rest is not a bad thing. I don't want you to hear me say this morning that you don't need to rest. As a matter of fact, there's some weird thing that's happening in our society where, like, the person who rests the least is, like, the best, right? You get a group of guys in a room, and you, they get to talking about their schedule and how busy they are. And, like, the person who's the, the, who's the most awesome is the person who sleeps the, le- the least and has the most going on, right? Where we just, we think, man, we don't, rest is for the weak. I'm not, I, well, hear me, I don't want you to hear me saying that. You need to rest. Rest is a good thing. You need to take a day off, okay? But so many of us live our lives looking for rest to the point that we have made an idol out of comfort and ease and rest, hoping that a better circumstances will make us have a better life. If I could just take a day off, if I could just rest, if I could just veg out. And the sad part about that is, listen, your need for rest is never ending. Because if you take the day off and you go to work tomorrow, you know what you're going to need on Tuesday? Some rest. Parents, let me, let me prove it to you this way. How many of you have ever been on vacation? Like real vacation. I'm, not, I'm talking about not taking kids with you. Like real vacation. Just you and, and your significant other, right? you somewhere on a beach with a little umbrella drink. Man, it's vacation, okay? I, I'm not there with you. I'm, you know, I'm not judging you, okay? And, man, you, you read a book. You, you, you just rest, okay? And you come back from that vacation four, five, six days, and what are you? You're tired from being on vacation. And here's what I'm trying to show you. Rest is not your end goal because you're never going to find rest and peace here on this world, on this earth. The only place you're going to find rest is in Jesus. So if you're here today, and I'm mentioning this specifically to believers, if you're here today, listen, and you're tired, you're like, man, I, I cannot keep going. I'm at my wit's end. I'm tired. I just need to rest. Here's what I want to encourage you. Don't call in sick tomorrow. As a matter of fact, set your alarm clock for 30 minutes earlier than you would have. Wake up tomorrow morning. Open your Bible. Get on your knees because the only place you're going to find rest is not in any easier circumstances, but in the presence and power of Jesus Christ. You might be here today, man. You're like, you're like I've been several times this past year, my, my wife probably this past year has heard me say this more than ever before. But between school and, and, and man, God's blessing this church, like that's awesome. 
but there are things that come with that that we don't we didn't know we're going to come with that right when we were 150 people like we didn't know that growing meant more stress like we're just like this is awesome right so as we've grown and i've been bouncing these things my wife has heard me say this probably more times this year than she ever has before like i'm at my limit right anybody ever been there maybe you're there now here's what i want to encourage you here's what because man this is where jesus has convicted me and brought me back to if you're at your limit don't take tomorrow off wake up tomorrow morning 30 minutes earlier stay up tonight 30 minutes later and get on your knees before god and pray and say jesus i am at my limit and i need you to be my peace because it's time to stop looking for rest in places we're never going to find it because only jesus the prince of peace can bring it to us would you pray with me god Thank you for who you are. Um, Lord, I just, this morning has been a whirlwind, dear God, and I just pray that you would use, dear God, the foolish ramblings of a man, dear God, to glorify yourself. God, I just pray that you would forgive me if I said anything this morning that was not what you would have me say, dear God, because I know that that's within the realm of possibility, dear God. I know that so often, dear God, I get in the way. And I just pray that you would forgive me of that. I pray over the next few minutes we would turn our hearts and our minds toward you in worship. And we would leave this place more in love with you than ever before. In Jesus' name.